Hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, coming to this session where we will talk about frostbite procedural trains. Uh, my name is Julien Keble, and I am the team lead for Frostbite Terrain Tools. I've been at Electronic Cards on the Frostbite team for uh, some eight years now. And at first, I was working on the, the runtime side of things, where I had lots of fun. Uh, but later on, there was an opportunity to explore procedural creation tools, which I found really uh, exciting. So I switched on the tooling side, and uh, never switched back, actually. And that was to lead the project, which I'm talking about today. As you might know, Frostbite is EA's proprietary engine. It powers a large number of games ranging from sport titles to racing games, first-person shooters, and space game, uh, like the well-received uh, Dead Space remake that came out of Motive, which is a studio located in Montreal, where I happen to be coming from. Uh, this talk focuses on terrain tools, so let's uh, only keep those titles that actually have uh, Frostbite terrains. We'll remove, remove those space games and uh, almost all sports game, and this leaves around 60% of titles, which is quite a lot. So before we begin, uh, I just want to set expectations. So this is not a straightforward programming talk. It's kind of a fusion between a programming one and a visual arts one that caters to both sides of the spectrum, so part technical info, uh, part eye candy. And uh, we will start with a short overview of the part of Frostbite Terrain that is relevant for this talk. Then I will explain what we did in the editor and the reasons we did it. Uh, think of it as a sort of dev diary where I'll be showcasing the features in the order we designed and added them over time. After that, we'll go straight to ship results uh, with, where all the eye candy will be sort of like eating dessert before the main course because all the proteins will be right after because we will uh, talk about implementation details and architectural choices. And we will conclude this with a short, short retrospective and Q&A if we have time. So Frostbite Train Runtime is uh, best in class. It's very scalable, supports arbitrary view distance, arbitrary levels of details, and moving speeds that range from a soldier walking to a jet flying. It's backed by an efficient virtual texture system uh, which support complex materials. It also has runtime mesh scattering, which is entirely GPU based uh, for things like small environment objects like grass and small size rocks and such things. And being the engine used by Battlefield, it obviously has support for destruction through things like uh, height field deformers and local texture updates. So let's start by looking at a simplified view of the terrain material data flow. In the editor, artists author a number of data maps uh, for various aspects of the terrain. We call these rasters. They're just essentially 2D images that are broken up in tiles of varying resolution, but they're generally around two samples per meter in the gameplay areas. There is, of course, a height field, which provides the topology. Uh, we also have a color map, which provides four channels of data that can be used in the runtime. And there are many other rasters usually defined, but I won't really cover them. Uh, they're not so relevant for this talk, like one about uh, that controls tessellation level. There's also one that controls how deep the train can be destroyed at any specific uh, location. And then you have a num number of material masks. And these all get sent through the, the asset pipeline to get optimized in some way. And in the runtime, uh, a material has a corresponding shader that produces a continuous texture that tiles seamlessly. And these shaders can also read from the height field and color map, so they can be fairly complex. Uh, then the opacity that the shader outputs gets multiplied with its corresponding material mask. And blending all these together, you produce one tile of terrain texture. So this particular one here is just programmer art, not really beautiful. And part of the reason is that the textures are just fading into one another. Uh, in reality, this, this blending stage is fully programmable through a node-based system. And if you're actually fading a texture into another, it would look more like this. Uh, so you can have the sand appear in cracks before they, they, they're, uh, they're at full opacity. Another thing about Frostbite is that if you take any 
location, you can have uh, multiple numbers of layers there, which means you can have complex materials with interwoven different uh, different materials. Yeah. Um, so while the runtime aspects are really interesting, uh, we won't be talking much about them because um, all I'm going to talk about happens here if we take this as a timeline. So meaning it's it's not an asset pipeline uh, trick. It's not a runtime thing. It's really something that is in the editor. And uh, another way to frame it is to, is to say that we will talk about controlling topology and uh, where these material appear at medium and large scale. The reason is that the small surface details is essentially handled by those material shaders. Okay, so when we started this project some five years ago, most terrain work was done through manual painting. And as much as it was time consuming, it paid off because, for example, DICE had a reputation for creating high quality maps. But this came at the cost of excessive manual work. And when things were not done manually, they were uh, they went through expensive uh, import export cycles into external DCCs, which takes extra time and means slower iterating. So how can we improve from this? Um, well, one way is to externalize more terrain tasks into external DCC. Uh, maybe a tool specifically for procedural trains, maybe uh, Houdini, and then uh, we could create some kind of bridge between the two. Maybe it's a script that uses an API, and if you're lucky, you get a button that uh, automatically refreshes from the editor. Wait a few seconds, and you see the result. But we wanted to approach this differently. We want we we decided to bring back uh, the sort of run of the mill eighty percent of terrain workflows directly in the editor. The part that is about level design, where it really makes a great impact to be able to iterate inside the editor. Uh, so why? Uh, well, we thought it would lower the cost of entry for light procedural tasks. Maybe you're not making an open, open world game. Maybe you're just a small studio and all you want is flat and near roads. So you don't need the full setup. And second, uh, live feedback meant easier experimenting through faster iterations. Not live feedback as, wait a few seconds, live as uh, you drag something and you get the whole stack to refresh. And finally, we wanted to unlock future opportunities. Uh, say UGC, for example. Owning that tech means we could eventually use it in the runtime. I'm gonna talk more about that later. And uh, we're not fooling ourselves. We cannot replace Houdini. We actually love Houdini and use it all the time everywhere, but uh, we wanted to own a few of those workflows. So Houdini can still read the train data uh, and be used for other things like uh, procedural asset placement and some other train tasks, for example, sand simulation. We, want, we wouldn't try to do it in the editor. It's not worth it. So the first thing we knew we needed is to break out every raster into overlays. Fairly simple move, um, or obvious, should I say. Um, to be fair, th those should probably be called layers, but that word that was already taken for terrain layers, so we named them overlays, but you can think of them as layers. And uh, with that, any modification could be located on a specific overlay and happen in a non-destructive way. So you might notice this pattern exists in the runtime as we compose, composite the train layers together to get one piece of, of texture. And in the editor, each material mask itself is made from compositing different overlays. So it's exactly like that. So if we zoom a bit on this, uh, each overlay has obviously a data channel, but also an opacity one, an alpha one that stores uh, yeah, opacity transparency. And the rest is pretty standard. There's a blending stage. And uh, in that blending stage, we support things like a global opacity multiplier, uh, blend modes. I think we have 12 of them. And blending all overlays together, you produce your final height field raster, or maybe your mask raster, your color map raster. They're just generic images, after all, with only their pixel format varying. Everything is sort of uh, interchangeable. Height field R-flow, color map is RGBA, and so on. 
Uh, this is how it looks in the editor. So all the rasters are like collapsible sections and uh, their content is uh, children overlays, basically. We also have folders and the idea is that the folder content gets blended and then, uh, I mean, the, the children of the folder gets blended and the folder's content is that blended result. So what type of overlays do we have? Uh, obviously, we will need paintable overlays. These are your standard overlays onto which you would just brush with tools, for example, or maybe you could uh, import images from an external BCC. They're just static and they're saved on disk. Uh, so at this point, we have a nice layered setup that is non-destructive, but we're not procedural yet. Everything is still manual. So that's why we added auto paint overlays, as we call them. There's a second type and you cannot brush on these. Their content is entirely produced from objects that act as uh, terrain brushes, essentially. So let's look at how this works. The basic idea is to have assets expose a number of what we call auto paint behaviors that are named. And on the other side, uh, you have the auto paint overlays, which sort of sus subscribe to these uh, behaviors. Um, and then this produ produce produces some result. Uh, before we continue, I just wanna talk about this rainbowy color we have here, because I'm going to be showing some more of these. Uh, it's essentially a heat map with zeros and ones standing out. Um, yeah. So what is a behavior? Um, as I said, it's kind of like a, a terrain brush, uh, assets behaving as terrain brushes. And at its core, it's simply a mesh, a transform that can deform the mesh and some shader with some parameters. And as simple as it is, uh, the power comes from the different workflows that are enabled by combining different meshes and shaders. And the idea is just to take a, an orthographic camera and grab a snapshot of the mesh from above, and this is your result that you stamp on the overlay. So if we imagine a very simple case where you would use the asset's own mesh to auto paint, um, just with this you can get surprisingly useful results, as we'll see in a moment. Since overlays have opacity information, the shaders output both the data for the data for the content and its alpha or opacity. If you're auto painting on a mask, it's very simple. You just write one in both data and opacity. This gets the mesh projection stamped on the overlay. When auto painting on the height field, you just output uh, the fragment's height as the data and zero for opacity and one for opacity. And this deforms the height field so it perfectly wraps the object. So let's have this shown in practice. Uh, the rock here is on wet sand, but we'd like to make the two better integrated together. So let's, uh, and also add some variety. So let's add a little bump uh, on the sand. We can uh, limit the effect by scaling the mesh using the transform. Uh, then let's uh, use a mask auto paint on a sort of rippled sand mask, and we also make it a bit bigger. And the second mask, why not? A some sand with gravel, and we get this effect. And in the editor, it's live. So as the rock transform is changed, the projected shapes are impacted because they inherit that transform on top of their own. So this is actually three rock meshes aggregated together. That's why they rotate a bit funny. <laughs> Confession here. So not, not only static assets can be auto-painted, uh, same goes for roads there. They're also a mesh, although a dynamic one that is generated from a spline. So a typical workflow is to flatten the height field where roads are. And by generating a slightly, slightly wider mesh, we can have the auto paint shader fade out the flattening on the, on the sides by using the opacity channel output so that they better integrate with the environment. So this is how it looks like in the editor. So with this, we can see why interactivity is not just a nice to have, uh, being able to iterate that quickly has a strong impact on the final quality. When a user moves a spline, they're not guessing what the procedural output will be. They see it at in-game quality as they work. Another thing you can do by auto-painting a mesh directly on the height field is what we call auto-paint blockout. Uh, somebody figured this out uh, and we didn't see it coming, but the idea is to work with a library of abstract shapes, uh, landscape features, and sculpt the height field piecewise using those shapes. 
Uh, key to this workflow is obviously having the auto-paint work in uh, max blend mode, so intersections are seamless. And yeah, you can iterate rapidly with this. Here's another workflow we have, we call uh, Capture. The idea is to have artists place assets in a level where they paint a sculpt around the assets, and using a volume, we capture this terrain into textures and we automatically create the behaviors in the asset prefab. Uh, bottom line is when you place the asset in level, the terrain follows with it. Uh, another combination, combination, a road mesh with the texture and you get a nice uh, riverbed carver spline. So this is from uh, an internal demo that was made by a small team of artists uh, and it showcases a number of texts we built and it has a lot of auto paint workflows that I just showed. For example, the height field is all blocked out. Uh, the stone stairs carve the height field around them using custom meshes and all trees have uh, auto paint capture. Okay, uh, there is one last type of overlay we added to get a full feature set, and it's effects overlay. Uh, these include generators and filters and more, but the idea is that they're applied on the whole terrain. They just, they, they don't relate to objects and you cannot brush on them either. So as first, we, at first we started adding generators like Voronoi, uh, which can be applied on a mask, or the height field. Again, everything is interchangeable. They're all images. And uh, you can create also this slightly unsettling breathing terrain, which I made by playing with a slider. <laughs> um, one thing I want to mention is that to create these effects, we chose to leverage our runtime node-based shaders, which obviously had large consequences on, on the overall architecture. Uh, but I, I will talk more about this later. So the great thing about this is that since our tech artists already know this, uh, this tech, they can just uh, author their own effects, basically, to augment the basic library. So going back to this uh, overlay compositing diagram, we have now overlays that get their content from shaders. And it seems it would be very easy to provide them with the previous stage, the previous blended overlay, so, which means uh, we can create filters. So that's the next thing we did. Uh, blur, dilate, warp, and again, you can blur the height field or color map, anything. Uh, but in many cases, what users want is to generate masks derived from the topology. For example, maybe they need a mask that matches the flat areas. So there's a very, very straightforward way to make this possible, which is to provide the height field to all uh, effects systematically. And we did that exactly at first. So it unlocked a new uh, family of interesting effects, like the slope mask I, I was talking about, but also one to highlight height ranges, for example. And we also made more complex ones, like kernel-based filters, uh, curvature filters to highlight concavity or convexity, or this relief filter, which is showing the height compared to the average height in a radius. And we also create created uh, ray marching effects, like sun exposure. Like this particular one really looks like it's, it's in game with lighting, but it's actually just the mask that is using a black and white palette. And it's very useful to bake, uh, bake shadows for one thing, or you could use that to uh, simulate vegetation growth, for example. And what's nice is you can also accumulate the whole sun arc over a day, for example. We have nice features like that. And we also have one that does ambient occlusion, and it's pretty much like you would do in a screen pass in runtime, except it's, uh, it's done on the height field, and it shows the amount of sky visibility. So far, so good. Uh, we can read from the height field, uh, but soon enough came new requests to have things be able to write to the height field. Say you want the terrain to be more lumpy where the snow is, uh, you need to, the height field to read from a mask or maybe you want your asphalt mask to delete the grass mask. So clearly this original setup won't work. And you might see what is coming, but what we need is a full dependency graph. So if we pause a moment, moment we have this layered UX and we also want this node-based thing. So um, 
at this point, we kind of took the decision to keep the layered UX because it's kind of people are familiar with this. And uh, if you're not in a lot of spaghetti dependency, it kind of really fits the bill. So what we did is uh, add navigational arrows, basically. Each overlay show their incoming and outgoing connections, and the users can navigate like this. So this kind of sums up what we have in the end. Uh, talk is not finished, but this is just one clean way to wrap things up. We have a graph, a node-based graph backend that is invisible and automatically generated from the layered UX that has dependency navigation. So there's one last piece of the puzzle that's still missing, which is iterative processes. A uh, classic example would be erosion. This is just anything that you need to run a number of times to get the final result. And to do that, we added a sort of uh, a way to declare how output textures are routed back into input textures. And we can just run the effect a number of times by swapping the outputs with the, with the input. And with that, we could implement things like thermal erosion, for example, which happens to be quite fast because you can still brush right under the effect and see it live with no performance impact whatsoever, which is great, but not surprising because GPUs are really fast these days. And at the same time, those rasters, again, are like two samples per meter. So unless you're painting on a, with a one kilometer brush, uh, you should be fine. And then we added also water simulation. Uh, that's a very important brick of a procedural toolkit. Um, and we have a mode that just lets the water flow and one that accumulates water to uh, produce flow maps. And we made it to the candy part. So time for some ship results. Uh, the first game I'm going to talk about is EA Sports PGA Tour golf game. Uh, and they have a particular setup because they work from LiDAR scans. They are, they're reproducing existing courses. So what they get is, from these scans are uh, high-density point clouds for the height field and then a number of vector paths for like important features, bunkers, fairways, uh, greens, and roughs. And then through Houdini, they extract the actual height field and masks uh, that they can import in Frosted, which is the name of the editor, by the way. And uh, inside Frosted, they uh, iterate using our tools to do minor, minor changes, but important ones. An example is this one. So uh, for some reason, they found they wanted to increase the lip on the sand bunkers, the yeah, bunkers, that's how it ca it's called. And uh, to use that, to do that, they used the sand mask that was fed to the height field in subtract mode. So they could just tweak what they wanted, obviously faster than painting by hand. Uh, other things they did, uh, they added a bit of clumpiness in the rough areas using like Perlin noise modulated with the height field curvature. They derived a number of additional masks like gra uh, dry grass versus grass versus semi dry grass, I guess. Um, and all this, all these were driven from topology operators or filters. Uh, this screenshot has a number of them together. There's also little mounds at the base of tree that were added with auto paint and uh, yeah, a lot of things. All right, so now let's talk about Battlefield. Um, as opposed to PJ Sports, which worked from, works from LiDAR scans, they needed to iterate a lot more on the levels, if only for gameplay reasons. Uh, so they were a lot freer to experiment with the tools, and frankly, they surprised us in many different ways on many occasions by going beyond what we had initially made the tools for. So they really pushed the tools to their limit, which is great. So this, uh, this map is a location where water has recessed, leaving pools of rusty water. And an uh, uh, important visual thematic is those sediment lines, I guess I would call stratified lines. And at small, case, uh, small scale, this is produced in the material shaders that can read from the height field. And at distance, uh, you have larger ones that are coming from the color map, as you can see in a second. So uh, if we pull back the curtain for a moment and examine the foundation of this level's terrain, 
there are 20 or so material layers that are used and they have shaders uh, that read from textures and break up the tiling in seamless ways. And they all write to the train virtual texture, which has typical G-buffer channels, but also uh, vertical displacement, or should I say a normal based displacement. And uh, so this view shows all the materials together with nothing else, pretty patchy and kind of flat at distance. So that's why we have the color map. So the color map adds variation. And uh, since all materials read from it, they, uh, it can also control the overall hue of all materials. So this is showing the, both together. And then adding decals, which are essentially meshes that write on the virtual texture and all those same channels, including displacement, so that's how they can sort of dig a bit into it. Uh, now adding objects, starting to come up together nicely. And the one missing thing is, uh, maybe you guessed it, GPU scattering, which is small scale vegetation and small scale objects. Um, again, completely GPU, GPU power in the case of frostbite and the um, placement is, is driven by uh, material masks. So if we look at how the procedural data operates together, uh, we start with, let's say, material rasters first. And then they also added a number of what we call like utility rasters, concept rasters. They're not really sent, they're not sent in the runtime. They're just references for, from, uh, for other masks to read from. And they influence the material masks, but also things like the color map. Adding the height field, uh, the height field pretty much writes to everything. And the objects, again, impacts everything, including the height field. So this is just a simplified overview. The actual graph looks like this. Nobody ever looks at that except me a couple of times, I guess, to debug. And uh, one thing to mention is that the, you can see most connections are coming from the height field topmost overlay because everything reads from topology. All masks almost read from topology, but there's other connections as well. So it's impossible to look at everything, but let's just take one mask, for example. Uh, this one is called Rock Color. It's a utility mask. So it's, it's not driving a shader, it's just used by other things. Uh, so it starts off with Cliff Mesh Auto Paint. One thing to notice is that the Auto Paint discards anything below the height field, because Auto Paint can also peek at the height field. And then a bit of blur is added, then slow blur, which blurs in the direction of slope, sort of creating a sort of leaking effect, I guess. And then a bit of uh, height map is used, uh, height range is used to trim the top off and levels to, for a final tweak. So if we follow that, uh, it's used in the color map and it's uh, looped in one of these folders and it creates this sort of dark and brownish tint effect. And adding all those folders one by one, we, we can see how they built it, they, uh, really layer by layer. I won't add them all one by one because it's too long. But the final thing, uh, the final color map looks like this. This is a bird's eye view. And you can see it's completely procedurally generated, meaning that if anyone changes the height field, anything should readapt uh, instantly in the editor. And if other rasters depend on the color map, they, they would get in turn uh, updated. So not all levels use a procedural color map. Uh, sometimes they use satellite imagery, especially when, when the level is based on the real life location. And it's the case with this next level, which I'm gonna talk about. So uh, again, all material masks are driven from procedural operations. You can see the plow lines on the back, plowing lines, I guess. And there's some curvature going on there probably. Uh, so if we take just one uh, mask, one such mask, this one is called, sorry, this one is called uh, snow grass. It's kind of snow with a bit of a dry, uh, grass blades peeking through. Uh, it starts off with ambient occlusion as the as its basis. 
And then uh, this is a, a selection from the color map, a, rain, a color selection. Maybe the greens are pulled in, for example. Then uh, the river is removed using a, a height selection. Then a bit of flow map, water simulation. Then a uh, number of auto-painted things are removed, like roads and trees. And finally, uh, artist touch-ups. So this last overlay is where artists can override anything. Uh, say the game designer wants some extra cover using mesh scattering, for example, it can just be added using brushes there. The next map I'm going to talk about is called Hourglass, and it features a city that has been lost to sand as the result of uh, desertification and sandstorms. So the main feature of the train is obviously sand dunes here. And before we look into this map, uh, I want to show you again our road auto paint tool. So this is just two intersecting roads, very basic. Uh, let's fix the intersection by using a max blend mode, which we support between objects on the same overlay. Uh, making the road width zero and then making the fall off 100 meters, we get this. And tweaking the curve of the fall off, we get this. Maybe you see where this is going. It's essentially looking like a sand dune, right? And when I opened this map, this was the first map I opened, by the way, uh, when they started production. And I saw this and I had no idea what was going on. And it turns out it's hundreds and hundreds of roads. And so I had to call the, <laughs> the, the, the person that thought about it. And Michael Anderson is his name. And I asked him, like, isn't it? It's fascinating, but isn't it a bit overkill to have all these hand placed? And he said, no, it just took me two days. And it's actually quite useful because this is a first person shooter, right? And so when you iterate, you can get calls very late in production that are basically, can you clear this line of sight and remove all sand dunes? And it turns out you can actually just grab the sand dune and move it or copy it. And uh, again, showing like how powerful it is to get instant feedback. You're not guessing what it will look like once you run your procedural external DCC, you just see it live. And if there are some effects over it, you see that as well. The next level I'm gonna talk about was made uh, with a lot of photogrammetry and the studio uh, called Ripple Effect that made it found a location that matched the look they were after. So they went out on a field trip probably had tons of fun and collected uh, materials for assets using photogrammetry. And they made this. Uh, one is the real one, one is the frostbite version. And I know because the reference ball is on a stand in one of the two. So pretty amazing. And here's a trailer, uh, internal trailer, but I guess it's not internal anymore if I show it. Okay, so it may be surprising considering how monochromatic this level is. It's a desert, essentially, but it actually has 24 different material layers, uh, which together contribute to create a very detailed and rich landscape. Um, there, are, there are also 15 utility masks that are defined and as much as 122,000 auto-painted auto objects. So that would be splines mainly, but also rocks and buildings. 
So uh, let's look at the height field for a change. Uh, if we add every overlay one by one, what we see at first is uh, essentially the evolution of the level over time as they were changing major features by adding mountains and, and things like that, this, uh, meaning they cannot just walk back their decisions since it's all overlays uh, and it, it's non-destructive. So adding those, and then you get this thing, which is uh, creating flow lines in the height field, and it's coming from this mask, which is defined using a flow map and uh, other things, and then the roads are deleted using auto paint, or maybe a, actually a reference to another mask. And finally, you, you have this thing, which I'm gonna talk about. So uh, remember how this looks. It's adding detail outside of the gameplay area, essentially. And finally, road auto paint and uh, yeah, that's it. So um, this is a texture that the runtime shader use at distance to like big boulders essentially. And what they wanted to do is um, create more details at distance. They essentially wanted to bake the displacement like you would at, uh, have at uh, close distance, but they wanted to bake it in the height field at distance. And because we used uh, our rendering shaders, they could just copy their run runtime shaders in, the, in, in effect and use the same complex detailing algorithm uh, like this. And so they could bake it in like this. And you can show this effect at distance where the height field is, uh, has this nice texture. All right, we made it up to the proteins. Um, so when we planned this framework, we had the, the ambitious goal to have live, real-time feedback. This not only means we need fast terrain updates, but in the first place, we need to know when the terrain, when, when a change invalidates the terrain. So this can, can get pretty tricky uh, for auto paint uh, because one reason is that behavior definitions can be nested deep into prefabs of prefabs. So uh, we need to track all this. In other cases, it's pretty simple. Uh, for example, if a brush is applied. So let's look at this case and sort of trace um, what happens when a brush stroke is applied. So the brush, the brush event triggers an update request, which, uh, which has the ID of the modified overlay and the impacted world coverage. And in the editor, there is a job queue. So the first thing we need to do is create uh, jobs that will refresh the modified terrain. Uh, as you know, the back end is a sort of direct graph. So we start, we need to walk from the, the overlay where, where the change uh, happened and walk to the end nodes to find what has been uh, modified. So from this, we can identify a primary, primary job, which is the raster that owns this overlay you're painting on, but also secondary jobs that are just the side effects. Uh, primary jobs means uh, they need to be prior high to have high priority and secondary job can probably wait a little. But wait, uh, right after the paintable, there's a blur. So let's suppose what you brushed is this GDC logo. The blur is going to spread the change, right? So you need, probably need to rebake a bit larger. And it would be the case for other things like uh, curvature, any kernel filter, filter or iterative processes you would be in the same situation. So how can we fix this? Well, one way, which is what we did <laughs> first again, is you could just slap an extra 30 meter everywhere, right? And it works. Until the day, it doesn't work because someone calls you and says, hey, your terrain is broken, look at that. And you say, oh, just raise it to 100 meters. And it still works, but you're impacting, your per performance is degrading over time. So the right way to fix that is that as you're walking, um, the pad from the overlay, you need to add up the spread of uh, like how much each overlay spreads the change. In the case of blur, it's very simple. It's just a radius, but it can get pretty tricky, like warp uh, has a very complex expression. And then you get the final, uh, final coverage you actually need to refresh. So when the jobs are created, once the jobs are created, um, we don't immediately insert them in the queue. We try to be smart about it by recycling existing jobs that just that can just be extended. Um, ex for example, if you're brushing on the height field, tons of masks are impacted, but until you mouse release, we won't process these. So wh while we push them in the queue, we, we don't create tons of fragmented overlapping jobs. 
because of this simplification. And then we just do a sort and insert in the queue and we sort by kind of obvious things like frustum intersection. You don't need to refresh what you're not looking at. Uh, you don't need to refresh uh, secondary jobs as fast as primary ones and camera distance. And then job execution deserve its own uh, section, so let's go. So the first thing to mention about job execution is that we use an external process. Let's call this uh, the train update service. It's actually a sort of lightweight frostbite rendering stack. And uh, why did we do that? It sounds like uh, asking for trouble. Well, again, we wanted to leverage our node-based uh, shader graphs that we have in runtime. And we also wanted to not code a whole graph engine that we have that gets compiled to bytecode in the engine and the runtime. And finally, as I mentioned, we wanted to sort of own this tech and have it in the, having it in the runtime sounded like a good idea just to unlock future ideas like UGC, for example. So we did that. And in the end, that's what we have. On the one hand, you have um, Frosted, which has all the world data like auto paint objects, their transforms. We have spatial lookup tables to be able to know exactly what needs to be part of a big job. And uh, train tile data also lives there. And the rule graph uh, is generated there. And the, and the update service, we have built runtime built version of the graph and the shaders. And we're essentially running a context agnostic image processing graph there. So when a job is removed from the queue to be processed, it is, uh, we, sent, we send an RPC call that has a number of different informations. Uh, but one thing to highlight is that we use GPU shared memory resources. And using this, was, uh, using this shared memory was key for us to reduce the friction involved in having those two process talking to one another. Um, after all, train data doesn't need to leave the GPU. You're displaying it there, but you're also processing it there. And when it's done, we just send an RPC back with some statistics. So zooming in on the active nodes that are in the input RPC data, um, the editor takes care of caching all the dependencies between overlays and outputs and the other direction. So it can provide a list of active nodes that are needed uh, given a, an output node, basically. And it sends this as part of the information. We also need to provide uh, paintable tiles. Paintable tiles are stored on disk, so th the editor has them. And uh, they actually live on a, in tiles, as I mentioned earlier, but they're also laid out on a quad tree. And, um, so we need to re re revisit this uh, algorithm of uh, spreading change because in, it works in the other way as well. If a blur spreads the change, it also needs to read from that same radius. So as we walk back from the end, uh, we need to add up these look, lookout ranges to get the actual coverage we need to bundle the tiles uh, for. And uh, what we do is we push them into GPU memory, uh, into the tiles are pushed in 2D texture arrays. And we have an indirection texture that maps the world position to the tile index. So basically, uh, the paintable overlays job in terms of uh, processing is just to unindirect, I guess, uh, pr produce a flat tile where tiles are not separate, basically. OK. Uh, Retrospective and takeaways. Okay, um, so there's a very important question we can ask ourselves, which is how much of the procedural content had to be manually repainted by game studios? In other words, like if what we produce is the equivalent of macaroni art and they needed to, a major surgery to make it live up to the studio standards, uh, we failed, right? So if we look at a battlefield map from season one, we here are shown three representative masks. Um, and we can see that around 15% are have touch-ups. That's why I'm that's what I'm toggling on and off here. And if we look at season four, uh, this is down to one percent. And 
the explanation was provided to me by a studio artist, and he said that as they get more familiar with the procedural tool, they can express more things and more organic looks um, and get closer to what they want just with the procedural tools, which is a nice thing to hear. So I'd like to go over a few design choices we did to see um, how they paid off or not. So the first one is this promise that we have, which is terrain is always up to date. Uh, again, uh, tracking full, the, the full auto pain chain of dependency uh, came to a cost. It's complicated. So maybe in hindsight, I would have gone for something like uh, auto pain gets refreshed as you move the object or change the transform, but maybe not if you change a parameter like three levels deep, then you could probably uh, suffer a right click and refresh object. Um, second, uh, using Frostbite runtime as a service, um, this obviously increase our dependencies and it came at a cost because we got sometimes broke by people that don't really know us <laughs> being on the tool side. So we made a lot of friends, maybe enemies, I don't know. Uh, but I think the decision still pays off uh, today in new ways. For example, with what I've shown about uh, using runtime shaders as effect overlays. And finally, um, the age old debate between node base versus layer UX. Um, so in the end, obviously levels expected our, uh, sorry, le levels went beyond our expectations of the, they, they, they were way more complex than we thought they would be. So um, I think we need better tools to navigate dependencies than just these little, little arrows. Maybe we need things like this kind of diagram that I have shown where dependencies are shown at the raster level, not at the overlay level, just to sort of get an overview of what the level is like. Or maybe we could go hybrid and have some rasters be node-based, some others, simpler ones, could stay in the layer paradigm. So uh, what lies ahead for us? Um, we need better UX, and that one of the examples of what we need is better presets. So effect presets, but also full raster presets. Imagine you have just a a dry grass coming with all the full layer stack, or maybe biome presets even. And we want to tailor the visibility of things to crafts, meaning like you can gradually ramp up. If you are coming on a, on a team just to do two weeks of painting, you don't need, need to see the whole procedural setup, for example. Um, so the maps that I've shown are obviously not uh, large in the sense of open world games. And we want to improve our multi-user workflows and tools and uh, improve on large data management. And obviously, performance uh, is key. So we can. there's a lot of opportunities when, where we could do smarter caching and have, uh, for example, higher GPU occupancy. The, the baking is quite sequential. We're not really, uh, there, there are gaps where the GPU is uh, sort of waiting for RPC calls and things like that. So we could probably improve on that. And yeah, so to sum summarize all this, we enabled procedural uh, training authoring in the editor by supporting live feedback, thanks to powerful GPUs. And uh, our workflows are non-destructive because we have overlays. And we have rich world asset integration using AutoPaint. The train uh, procedural rules don't live in their own little silo. They're aware of uh, walls and objects and we support complex data interaction because we have a node-based backend and all scenarios are possible uh, as long as you don't create cycles right and uh, it's extendable by tech artists because we're using runtime shaders so that's pretty much it uh, a couple of people i want to thank uh, cody ritchie who was there since the beginning had a lot of foundational idea Mathieu Gandon made this possible also uh, my family, uh, they saw me disappear for a month making these slides. And my team, obviously, trained tools, Jean, Vadim, and Sean, the whole procedural team, and the studios, obviously, that uh, dare to follow us in this crazy adventure. And um, that's it. I have a small uh, farewell outro that I'm going to run now.
Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. And we have time for a little Q&A, if there are questions, hot takes, anything. Hello. Hi. Oh, hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for the five course meal. It was delicious. Um, <laughs> I had a question uh, regarding uh, customization of the pipeline procedural tools relative to different studios. So different studios have different requirements where you have like PGA, they probably want really high level of quality for individual textile like tiles and probably large tile sizes or something versus battlefield. How customizable are those macro parameters uh, for the tool set? Yeah, uh, so there's one answer to that. If you're talking about like resolution specifically, maybe not. But uh, tile size, resolution, yeah. textile so density, all the... All the I, I really uh, talk briefly about it, but like our tile resolution is, is... So all tiles have the same pixel size, but they're on laid out on a quad tree mm. and you can just refine that quad tree uh, not infinitely, of course, but like to maybe something like eight samples per meter. Um, typically what game team do is that they have a sort of a, a resolution that, that goes lower with distance. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, did this on the uh, reply? Did, did, uh, this? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Um, quick question. Uh, when you guys are bringing in the effects layers or overlay filters for the artists, uh, like erosion and flow and stuff like that, what's the level of effort and how long does it take? Like if an artist comes to you guys and says, I want like sun direction or something like that, or like, uh, is it yeah. a huge effort for you guys to pull in those filters or? No, not really. Actually, um, no, it probably, I mean, it's, it's really using our runtime tech. So it's as quick as making a shader, which is probably around half a day, I would say, but obviously it depends on the effect, but half a day is the typical time I've seen to come up with a new shader. Um, they were all made by one of our tech artists, mo like all the, the ones in the default library, and he always comes up with new ones. And uh, so the, the response time, pretty quick, I would say. So how many, how many of those effects layers would you guys have or filters to choose from? Oh, uh, the presets, yeah. I would say like, I would say 30 maybe. Okay. Not, cool. Probably not as much as a fully dedicated, like tr procedural train DCC. Uh, we're not there yet. Like erosion is not like on par with the, the, the high end, I would say. Uh, but that's not where the, the value is. Uh, I mean, there, there would be obviously value than having like top notch erosion. We're working on it actually, but where the, the value is it is iterating with like objects and things like that, like level design, mm -hmm. not your foundational or uh, height field, you know. Yeah. Cool. Hi. Whoa, that's a lot louder than I thought it'd be. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sasha Chacon from Ben Studio. Um, I have a question on kind of the initial setup of this process. So you said that you maybe we're considering Houdini and setting up these tools beforehand, but then decided to switch entirely to doing it all in-house uh, on your own homebrew engine. Yes, I got this right. <laughs> well, we didn't, I, I, what I said is like, this would be one way, typical way to go, like using Houdini, of course. Uh, we, but we really wanted this sort of live feedback experience so it wasn't really a hesitation at first, you know. Okay. Um, but you did like most of your tools, like you've built them inside your engine. Yeah. Um, and I could see you wanted the live feedback. I'm just thinking like this probably took a lot of time for like programmers to make the nodes to make this possible. So given the timeline of things, where did the tool generation come in when the programmers like potentially might have had made those nodes? Like, did you have them at the ready or did you have to go back and forth between them? So the, the nodes, to be clear, the nodes were, first of all, not the most time expensive 
thing to code? Really not, actually. Because again, we're using the runtime shader node tech and tech, the, the nodes were not made by programmers. They were made by, by mostly one tech artist, honestly. And um, so, yeah, that was really not the, 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 the most complicated part. The most complicated part was the sort of inter-process, you know, uh, navigation, like having an, this an external process. And then we were kind of outliers being on the tool side, using rendering side. So that was most where most of friction was not creating the effects themselves. Honestly, uh, obviously some are more harder, like water simulation and things like that. But even those would be maybe five days. I don't know. Um, again, it's, we're talking about maybe 30 effects. So overall, not the, that's not where the, the battle was. Okay. Yeah. Cause, um, a lot of companies and a lot of like places that I've made games that usually like make most of their tools in Houdini. So I was just like trying to see like the benefit and like just completely like going full scale into your engine and abandoning Houdini, except for like for some small. Things. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, good question. Uh, but again, we're not abandoning it. Like what I mean is like, it's still terrain data is still there. For gra up for grabs for Houdini, for example, and it, in some levels, uh, I had to cut some slides, but some levels have Houdini uh, setups, like the, the last one I shown, uh, read the height field to generate flow, line, uh, flow spline decals, uh, roads, and Houdini is still involved in a lot of places, but we just sort of grabbed one aspect that is usually made through Houdini, and we brought it back for yeah, all the reasons I said earlier. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Regarding the 1% or 15% case of people that had to do manual modifications to something after using the procedural tools, how did that affect the procedural workflow? Did their manual changes get blown away if they needed to make more procedural changes or what happened? No, because that's the thing. The, they, they always had this topmost overlay uh, that is called like artist input or something like that. And that's where the changes, the manual changes were done. So that, that's the whole point actually of not being non-destructive because if you changed whatever, like the, your auto paint shader, uh, touch ups would still be there, um, and only affect those areas you, you, you paint manually. All the rest was still, you know, free to move. Uh, thank you. Hi there. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, that was great. Um, wondering, um, you know, it sounds like you have a lot of overlays and a lot of textures, a lot of materials on top of that. Um, where do those fit in memory? How do you deal with those both in the editor and in runtime? Uh, like, how do you manage uh, all that? Uh, I'm sure you can't go into detail, but uh, just curious, like, what's our yeah, strategies? Um, it, it all just works. Uh, no, <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, uh, okay. So you just like throw it all at the GPU and sit off. Uh, no, no, no. Or, okay, good, or good, what do you good. Mean by that? Okay. Yeah. The, so in that, from that angle, no. Obviously, uh, it's not not LODs all on the or, GPU. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we have a pool, you know, a budget on GPU, and like if you're brushing, like those style around where you're brushing will stay on the GPU. But if you move around and you're brushing everywhere, uh, we 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 notice we're missing some tiles, and we remove some from the GPU. It's Kind of that simple. I see. So, so yeah. like what's in memory typically, like when you're not editing, is just the last layer, like the final kind of compressed layer. Is that like how it usually, or a few layers, and the the source materials are kind of uh, the, the, not in memory? Uh, okay. Uh, so all the paintable tiles need to be in G GPU memory. Yeah. But the non-paintable overlays, like auto paint and effects, these are all sort of you know done just in time in in that uh, update service we have. And they're, they're eph eph ephemeral, is that a word? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they, you know, but the paintable ones need to be in GPU because uh, they're controlled from the editor. Um, and we actually want to move this uh, to, the, the, to that service. They don't really need to be in the editor. The brushing happens in the editor, but that's just a legacy thing, honestly, because we would want the brushing to be fully done on the GPU in that service. Uh, but we didn't have time yet. All right, thank you. Hey, thank you, great talk. Um, I'm curious on the resources on the GPU and then the the external process uh, is able to access the same resources 
uh, to avoid duplication. Yep. Uh, could you explain more about the technology that allows this? So there is such a thing as GPU shared memory, like at the OS level that exists. I, I, I had to Google it when, uh, five years ago. And uh, we actually stress it so much that they had to fix bugs in the drivers because we're like, you're brushing and it's like, and, um, and that's basically it, you know? Uh, so again, like we upload what needs to be in the GPU memory only, and that is uh, s like sent, but only the handle is sent, right? It's mm -hmm. an OS handle that is sent on the RPC call. Yeah. And using, uh, you know, acquire and releases, we coordinate that buffer that is shared between the two processes. Okay, thank you. Hey, final question here. Um, so you mentioned the use of satellite imagery to some extent in, in the within Frostbite, and and you know th this emphasis on hyper realism, these beautiful scenes that look so real. Um, I wonder to what extent you've used geospatial data within your own workflows to create scenes to make yep. more realistic. Yeah, uh, good question. So the the interesting thing about uh, Battlefield, for example, if we take the I, I mentioned PGA Sport was lidar data, so that 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 is. Uh, easily explain. Battlefield, uh, they were a bit freer in terms of what they could experiment with. So some maps are based from, uh, again, I, I'm a programmer, I'm not a tech artist. So I, I, this is just my be best, uh, not my best guess because I know a bit about it, but some maps were made using, uh, like the last one I, I shown, a bit of satellite data, uh, photogrammetry, and uh, LiDAR, I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, they, they, they had really varied approaches. There's not one, uh, I think they, they're actually coming up with probably a more unified approach as they learn the tools. But uh, for Kingston, it was, you know, different setups per level. Interesting, thank you. Okay, and thank you very much. Thank you.